generic models where this happens. It turns out there's a whole generalization of models of which the Ising is the lowest level, and by being the lowest level, it's non-generic. The non-genericity is tied to this fact that the spectrum bifurcates at every point, and that there's sort of a symmetry between occupiedness and emptiness of all of these, right? So it turns out, in a technical sense, what it means is that when I decimate a bond in the Ising model, I get, I never, I always take away two spins and they, they're frozen. Let's go back to the question you asked a minute ago. Two spins are frozen. Now, if I have a richer model, so I think about the Heisenberg model, the Heisenberg is the best one you should to think of. I take two spins a half and fuse them. I get a spin one. I can't just throw away the spin one as a singlet. It has to be spinning around and available to fuse with other things. And so once you do that, it turns out it's very, very much more tricky to think about uh, things like how to think of the RG. It turns out that the actual choice of moves on the tree. So for instance, if this was an I if this was a Heisenberg model, and say this decimation was taking two spins a half, and you can get a spin three or a, the first step I have two spins a half. Now, if I have a spin one, there are going to be three times as many branches descending from the spin one as there are from the single. Because the spin one can fuse with things in three different ways, right? Just thinking about Hilbert spaces and tensor products, you can see that a three-fold degeneracy of states there, there's only a one-fold degeneracy of states there. So I'm biased towards choosing the spin one if I want to sample infinite temperatures for the Heisenberg. So immediately that tends to tell you that things will be different at high temperatures versus low temperatures. But the Ising model is always the same, right? Whether or not, whatever I do, it's always just up or down. And that, that choice means that there's a symmetry between, uh, between going up in energy and going down in energy, which means that it turns out, for instance, we compute exponents for the Ising model. We have the same exponents for the highly excited uh, states. In this is certain exponent you calculate. It's the same for the highly excited states as it is for the ground states. It's only true for the Ising model. You do any other model, it won't. Right? And that's because of the fact that you're, as soon as you turn on the, you turn on the temperature, there's no longer a symmetry between going up and energy and down. As soon as you sort of go away from Ising, there's no symmetry between going up and temperature and going down in temperature anymore. So it's a, it's a good question that, you know, what, what, how do you think about this new model, and whether you generate other correlations. And so in those models, you might worry that, you know, if I have a certain coupling strength, it might be, the coupling strength depends on the spin representation, right? Because it's a sort of implicit strength of the spins. So you might worry about that correlation. So you can analyze a fixed point. There is a stable fixed point where these things are uncorrelated. But again, whether you flow to that fixed point is a delicate, delicate question. We've got numerical tests that seem to suggest that that happens by just doing exact diagonalization, comparing it with RG. And it seems to be reasonable. But you might always worry that in some huge system something goes wrong somewhere. It seems like an unreasonable worry, but it's not something that we can really rule out. So there's that. Okay. So, what I want to do is argue that, so you can actually write down the following equation. So, um, so for the Ising model, I can, let me think of the following. Let me think of rho of beta omega. So what this is, is going to be the distribution function. This is the probability. So it's sort of a number. It's the probability of bond strength beta at scale yeah. So let's say suppose I've run the RG for a while. What's the probability that my bond strength is uh, is beta when I've run the RG and the scale is gamma? So I have a theory. Think of this as doing RG in a theory with a cutoff, right? Gamma is just log of the strongest coupling. So think of the strongest coupling as playing the role of your cutoff and your normalization. So this is saying, as a function of the cutoff, what is my bond strength distribution? So this is the variable whose behavior will study under the RG. So we'll write down RG gradients with this variable. So if that's up, that what I can write down, let me write down an equation that I can explain it. some explanation. So this term is just so that I maintain the normalization of the probability distribution. If I scale my cutoff, right, I have to actually scale my distribution itself. So this is just saying, if you translate it back, it's saying, if I change my cutoff thing a little bit, I have to change this, otherwise the normalization gets screwed up. It won't be a good probability distribution. That's all this thing does. The second term is reflecting what I did in the RG. So what did I do with the RG? I chose three spins based, and so what I'm asking is, how do I, uh, so this is telling me, how do I adjust the probability of a spin having strength beta at some scale of the RG? 
Well, the first step I do is I need to measure the probability of having a spin that's at the upper end strength of the cutoff, right? So that's rho of zero comma gamma. The reason it's rho of zero comma gamma is because beta was equal to log, um, basically log uh, omega over j. And remember, by definition, the spins I decimate are sitting half the cutoff, so j equals omega. So this is going to be log of one, which is zero. So this is measuring a probability and saying the change in this probability is going to be the product of, two, of three probabilities, right? It's going to be the probability I shifted this bond. And then I have to ask, what's the probability that the decimation produced the bond of the right strength? That's what I'm asking. So the bond of the right strength is going to be set by the probability that I pick something at omega that's telling you whether I decimated something. And then to see how I feed back at bonds at different strengths, this statement is just saying, you know, my beta final <coughs> is equal to beta 1 plus beta 2 up to a constant, right? There's some delta function that, there's something that enforces that. So it's saying, what I want to do is, to get a bond of strength beta, I need to find a, I need to find two bonds in my existing distribution that added to beta, right? That's what this thing is telling me. And I'm summing over all the ways I can do that. Does that make sense? So this is just a, this is just translating that equation into probabilistic language, in the language of the beta. Okay? So that's all I really need at this point, because I can look at this and say, all right, you can do lots of stuff. You can run this as an RG flow. You can test that this works. But then you can show that the fixed point of this is basically e to the minus beta over gamma 1 over gamma. That's the fixed point of this. And all these I'm saying are for the Ising model. It gets a little bit more complicated when you're non Ising, when you're something that's not the Ising model. Okay, so this fixed point has this distribution, but remember, beta and gamma are both exponential numbers. So this exponential, so you know, if I look at log beta, beta over gamma, remember beta is going to be log j over omega, right? So if I actually do this calculation, it's going to actually be a power law distribution. So when this gets back to the statement that I can show that there's a power law distribution because this is the RG, and its fixed point is a power law distribution. So this is the power law. Okay. So what I want to argue is that this actually tells us some confidence that I can predict scaling properties of this theory. So what you want to do is the, the last thing I guess I can talk about in the last five minutes before I just sketch how things change uh, when you go away from the Ising limit is. So what can you do with this? Well, you can do the procedure I said, which is this RG. And you can actually do the sampling at infinite temperature. It turns out that what I did here was the Ising model without the J2 prime. When you add the J2 prime, you can look at put in corrections and see how this flow changes a little bit. And it turns out that will change the flow a little bit. That's because I was relying on the results of the clean Ising model, which is self fuel which actually pins down the flow. And you can map a phase diagram in temperature space as well. If you do, numerically you can do that. Numerically, you can induce a sampling procedure at any temperature because you just have to do Monte Carlo. Uh, to do it analytically, you have to do infinite temperature sampling to get away from this. The, the key point I want to make is that um, what you can show is if I look at a change in length scale, right? Then I have this is rho of the gamma v gamma, and that's because, uh, or at least it's it's uh, it's sorry twice this. And that's because the length is decreasing by two every time I decimate a step, right? So this is saying, what's the probability I decimated something, right? And that's changing the length by a factor of two. So if you solve this, you find that um, you find that the energy, so gamma, remember, was an energy. So you have a relation between log energy and distance. You find that energy goes as L to the psi, where psi equals one half. If you plug in that solution and solve it, that's what we get. Right? That's because the right hand side is going to be an exponential distribution when I solve it, then we get that L goes in this way. So that's telling me that actually uh, energy goes as distance to, um, so log energy scales with the distance. Which is very different from clean critical points, where we usually take up energy scaling with distance. This is telling you that the logarithm of energy scales with distance. So this is something that's characteristic of these strong disorder points. 
Yeah, so it's telling you the typical, it's essentially saying what's the typical energy scale corresponding to a typical distance scale. Or put differently, if spins are separated by a certain distance, what's the energy scale which I can excite them? There are various ways of thinking about this, in the same sense that you can think about dynamical scale. Okay, and this psi equals one half is equal to the psi of the ground scale. Again, this is an Ising specific. So you can actually boots, you can get a bunch of other results, but the basic idea, the basic flavor is that we have tools now to actually analyze phase transitions between highly excited states. Although here it didn't seem particularly rich because I looked at it and I said, okay, it's exactly the same as the ground state. You just say, take the same RG, but you just run it at high temperatures. Um, now it turns out that one thing you can do with from this analysis is we go back and compute the, this, the ideal state average entanglement entropy. And that turns out to be a, uh, a log for reasons that somebody just pointed out, that you have lots of singlets. So like, one thing you should think about is the takeaway message from this is what's the characteristic picture of the ground state? Well, you should think of the ground state as having sort of singlets on all scales in this sense. It's got this sort of entangled, where whenever I draw a picture like this, it's a pair of spins that have been tied up together in singlets. So ground state typically will have a lot of these singlets, will have a lot of overlapping singlets. The final ground state is a singlet. All excited states have this kind of singlet property. It's just that the particular state of this pair of spins is either a zero or a one, depending on which one I took. But then you can actually compute the entanglement statistically and show that the entanglement is actually just given by um, given by a okay. So the one piece of physics I did talk about is how to generalize. So this seems kind of trivial. We said, okay, I did the Ising model, and it looks like the excited states behave the same way. It turns out that that's closely tied to the statement I made with on the tree which I just erased, which is at every point of the spectrum, um, the excited states and the ground states look similar for every single decimation. Because the excited states and the ground states both were just occupied around these states, and I can just translate occupied them. They're both states that no longer participate in the RG. It turns out there's a generalization of these Ising models based on uh, these random bond chains. They have a whole class of generalizations based on SU2 level K and eons. So it's a fancy word. Or what we need is just a way of imposing a spin power. Why I might want to do that is the following. If I try to do this RG for the Heisenberg model, what ends up happening is the following. Let's take two spins and decimate them. Well, you got to spin one or a spin a half, uh, or you got to take a spin one or a spin zero. So I don't have bias towards the spin one if I were go towards infinite temperature. I'm three times more likely to pick the spin one state as the spin a half state. But then, suppose I take the spin one, it can fuse with another spin a half, and it can be a spin three halves or a spin one half. Now I have four choices of going to the spin three half state, and then only two choices of going to the spin one half state. So systematically, every stage of the RG, I'm biased towards higher spins, which means as I go run the RG for longer and longer, my system looks more and more like it has a bunch of very large spin uh, S objects floating around. And large spins became classical. And so it turns out that if you run the RG, it starts breaking down because of the generacies of the spectrum. Really. Just the RG rules don't make sense anymore. So people had figured out ways to solve this by thinking about other models that they could do things on that had that broke down as you took the limit of the Heisenberg model. What we said was we could approach it in a different way. We started with the Ising model. You can ask how do you deform this Ising model to something like a Heisenberg model. It turns out in the Majorana language it's possible where you replace each Majorana object with some more exotic object called an Enion. Those are, you know, it turns out that these Enion chains look very exotic, but they're actually mappable back to things like box models and uh, one one quantum stack map. You take these Enyon models, it turns out a generalization of the RG rules that gave work. You have to be a little bit more careful because once you confuse two things together to get a new spin, you have a whole new set of RG rules you need to take care of. It gets a little bit richer. You have to keep track not only of the distribution of the bond, which I was able to do, you also need to keep track of the distribution of the spins because once I start off with some, if I, even if I start off with a chain where everything is in one kind of spin, once I start generating higher spins, I need to keep track of that distribution. When you do all of this, you find that there's a whole rich array of uh, fixed points. But the, the nice thing is that they have similar structure here, but they have, so this stop with this, as you level as you do level k, you get something where the psi of the ground state is not equal to the psi of the So there's actually different exponents of the ground state in highly excited states. So it tells you that in those cases, temperature is a relevant parameter instead, in the sense that it's changing the fixed point behavior. You can actually also ask whether these are critical points or critical phases. It turns out in many of the cases you have what are called what are critical phases in these theories. In the sense that here, so coming back to the Ising model, I focused the critical point where you have self similar structure. So what I should say is you could have run the RG for something that had the systematic bias I put in 
earlier, which is saying, let's make all the even bonds bigger than all the odd bonds statistically. If you do that, eventually the RG procedure will actually start systematically decimating only even bonds, or systematically decimating only odd bonds. And that is no longer a scale invariant fixed point, it's actually a fixed point that's controlled by either having an Ising paradigm or an Ising stim loss. And so that allows you to access those two phases. This timerization is this perturbation that controls and whether this delta term, whether I bias things on the even bonds or the odd bonds. But it turns out such perturbations are no longer something I can sharply define once I can generate two spins confused to give another spin. Because then I've changed the notion of evenness and oddness. Right? So if I take four spins, I take the, the two middle ones and fuse them. Um, and I generate a new spin. I've just flipped the meaning of even and odd bonds anymore. So the kind of dimerization perturbation I put in don't, doesn't quite make sense anymore. So it turns out it's kind of harder to find relevant perturbations, so they seem to be more stable phases for these anyone bonds. They have a richer structure. So I think with that, I'm sort of giving you a sampling of ideas that we use to study excited states and excited state transitions with disordered systems. So we'll start there. Somehow, most surprising when I think the point is that with interactions, the fact that there's stable phases like that is more exciting, is the most exciting thing with these additional so, so, to answer my question, infinitesimal disorder is sufficient to, to make the In the absence of the absence of interactions. So, if, if you have to think about everything with disorder interaction plane. So, if I have strong interactions, right? If I have, say, I have some interaction strength, I put in a little bit of disorder. If the disorder is much less than the interactions, I would argue that most likely you won't, you'll just have the thermal phase again. You'll just have a single thermal phase, I think. But would you argue with that? It's interacting. As long as it's free fermions. No, no, no. interacting. <laughs> you said free fermions. I, 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 I would worry about the limiting process. Because I think initially I was with you, sure, because you know, as long as it's a nearest neighbor that has free fermions, there's nothing. Yeah. You know, localization like that. Very long, but once it's interacting, yeah. I think the worry is that the near the transition, things might be. But that's exactly what I said. I was, I was saying exactly. I said once it's interacting, it's probably you have to be careful about the limits of disorder versus right. interaction. If you have a finite interaction strength, and you take disorder well below that interaction strength, I don't think this will work. And possibly temperature. Right. Oh, and temperature, lower temperatures. Oh, lower temperatures. Because at least uh, Vadim's uh, numeric show a mobility edge of this model consistent with that. Oh. Sure. Again, this is delicate. I personally. I'm agnostic, but leaning towards the existence of a mobility edge. I think it would be sad. It would be weird if there wasn't. I like the past colleague around the Euler paper has strong arguments for what he said. But there are also now arguments against the mobility edge from pretty reasonable mathematical physicists. So now it's a back and forth whether that's there. Yeah. Thank 
conference. So thank you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Jonathan, who 